So um, to do that, you get to part five here. Sorry, I didn't mess it at the top here, but this is, this is the beginning of part five, where I want to talk about dialogue and a certain model of it that uh, came out of Latin America. So <laughs> um, I realize this is covering a lot of material pretty fast. So maybe we should take a deep breath here, kind of, you know, <sighs> slow down for a second. Maybe we can even slow down for two seconds. <sighs> right? And because uh, we're going to shift gears. And instead of talking about machines and AI directly, we're going to talk about people and their history. And uh, the context of this guy, Paulo Freire, who developed a very influential and really interesting model of education uh, that's influenced people like Bell Hooks and uh, a lot of progressive educators in the United States. And it grew out of an experience that Freire and the people he worked with in Brazil had, where they were trying to work with adults um, who had been very severely oppressed not just as individuals, but as communities, historically, right? Um, they were really part of the oppressed peoples of the world. And uh, Freire developed a technique for, for adult literacy, for teaching adults to read and write, um, which also fed into and drew on a tradition of what's called theology of liberation um, that developed at about the same time. We're talking the 1960s and 70s in Latin America, um, and this theology of liberation also developed to try and empower people, empower, empower the oppressed and help them to learn to, to read and name their world uh, and become agents in it in a liberated way. Okay, so just a little bit of background, which I think will be helpful for understanding Freire and the ideas about education that he's developing. First, there's, you know, there's sort of 1492 and all that, you know, the encounter between the Europeans and the indigenous peoples in, in uh, what we think of now as Latin America. Um, and uh, it involved in part um, conquistadores, conquerors coming and, you know, killing off leaders or taking over their, their roles uh, throughout Latin America uh, with military force. But it also involved um, the church, Catholic church coming and uh, taking over the local religion and ideology and opposing a new one, a Catholic view of the world and, and set of values, okay? So it was both military and ideological power at work. And this, you know, there were centuries of colonialism of a very direct sort were ruled by Portugal or Spain was involved. And then, um, and then you get separation from, from uh, Portugal and, and Spain, but then continued sort of uh, governments in Latin America and Brazil and elsewhere that carried on the same kind of exploitative, oppressive uh, government and, and continued with the same Catholic church teachings, right? But then um, in the 1960s and 70s, you start to get things changing. Um, there are dictatorships people are revolting against. Uh, in Cuba, you get Fidel Castro and Che Guevara, you know, Marxism being spread as an ideology. Um, you get um, Pope John the 23rd um, convening a, a Vatican Council to try and promote uh, outreach uh, to the poor. And um, a rereading of the Bible and a recentering of authority in, in groups that were called um, Christian based communities or comunidades de base. And there were conferences around all this that were happening then. And uh, one way to understand what was going on in the context of the church, as a way of background, is that um, the church was, while it was still, the Catholic church was still dominant in Latin America, it was starting to lose uh, participation. And it was being threatened by the evangelical churches who were coming down from Texas and elsewhere. And so they wanted to reanimate people and get them engaged in, in the, the church. Um, 
And uh, so one of the ways they did that was to have priests or delegates of the, of the priests go and form these little communities where they would get people talking about the Bible okay? and uh, thinking about how it's relevant to their lives. Okay? And they, they formed the, these Christian-based communities where in a way they were like little, little seminar groups, you know, where peasants who many, typically none of them could, or very few of them could actually read and write. You know, they would um, have a passage read to them from the Bible. Uh, and they were used to that, having priests read passages from the Bible. But what they'd been used to for hundreds of years was priests reading passages that say things like, the poor you shall always have with ye. Right? Um, which, or, or gather not up your treasures here on earth, but, you know, in heaven where your father is, where God is. Where the idea would be um, that, you know, as poor people, they should just accept the fact that there's got to be poor people in the world and they're, they're it this time around, you know, you're it. So just accept it. Don't revolt, don't complain. Live a good Christian life by being obedient. Do what you're told, right? And hope that you'll get your, your reward in salvation in, in heaven after you die, right? And they've been hearing stuff like that and been asked to just sort of passively accept it for uh, hundreds of years. But now suddenly um, the priests and the delegates of the word were coming and they were saying, well, here's a passage um, in the Bible, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What do you think it means? And they would go around the circle and sort of share what they thought it meant. And you should know first that this, that, that step itself was, um, in a way, really revolutionary, because they have the priests who'd always told them what to think in a passive way, giving them monologues in their, their preaching. We're now inviting dialogue and inviting them to be subjects, agents, to think for themselves. That, that was really you know, a revolutionary kind of thing to do for them. It was experienced in that way. Um, but then also it was really interesting what, what kinds of things they would start to say, like, you know, um, you know Jorge might, might be listening to this idea, well, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And you think, well, I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe it means uh, if I have a horse and my neighbor needs a horse, I should loan him my horse. Okay. So then what would happen is after these sort of weekly discussions, people would be living during the week and they, they, <laughs> have to live with the consequences of what they've been saying in the dialogue. So for example, you know, Guillermo might come up to Jorge, you know, on Tuesday and say, you know, you know that thing you said on Sunday with the priest about if your neighbor needs a horse, you should loan him a horse. I, my, my wife is very sick and, and I can't get her to the clinic. It's, you know, it's 12 miles away. Um, so I need a horse. And you have a horse. <laughs> and so, you know, Jorge would say, well, I mean, he would feel obliged to say, well, okay, you can borrow my horse, you know, start to live out the values and beliefs that he was articulating in the dialogue with the others, right? Um, but then what would tend to happen is, it might be that a bunch of neighbors would be coming and borrowing Jorge's horse all the time to the point where he wouldn't be able to get his, his uh, farming done, you know? And so at some point he might go back into the dialogue on the, the following Sunday and say, you know, we, we have a problem here, you know, there, because there are not enough horses. I don't have enough horse. I don't have enough horse to help everybody, you know? And so, you know, what the, the leader of the group the, would do, the, the facilitator would be to turn that question back to the group and say to them, well, okay, well, what really is the problem here and how, how might you address it, right? And so they might have some more discussion, you know, in this kind of seminar way where somebody might say, well, you know, the problem is, um, is not, uh, it's not just that uh, there aren't enough horses, is that, you know, the road, pinche road, the road up to, you know, to uh, um, the, the village over the way where the, where the clinic is, it's such a horrible road, you know? You know, and somebody else might say, well, the problem is the reason that it's a horrible road 
is because you know the mayor of this municipality has is corrupt and he's been stealing all the money that he should have been using to fix the road you know and somebody else might say you know well yeah but the real problem is we haven't gotten organized to say anything or do anything about that you know we just we just take it we just accept it we don't we don't complain you know or, or and somebody else might say well you know the, the real problem is we haven't gotten organized to uh you know to just do buy get 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 somebody to drive a bus in here or for a land rover or whatever so they would start to think collectively about their situation and describe it and name it in their own terms okay okay well so that was sort of going on in this theology of liberation tradition that I mentioned. And now at the same time, actually a little bit earlier, really, in many ways, uh, Freire is working in Brazil and um, he's drawing on Marxism and existentialism and other traditions to sort of develop creative ways to do uh, adult literacy. And uh, the traditional ways of doing adult literacy were not working at all. So, you know, they had these little books that people would use in schools. And some of you may be familiar with this kind of thing where, where um, the book would, you know, would have a picture of a boy and a girl and a dog. And the boy would be saying, look, Jane, look at Spot. Watch Spot run. Run, Spot, run. You know, and Jane would say, yes, Spot, come here. Come here, Spot. You know, stuff like that. Well, you can imagine somebody who's been working all day in a, uh, a sugar field or what have you, it's, it's just not going to be motivated to learn how to read and write that kind of stuff, right? So Freire was interested in developing a, a different set of teaching materials, and he did, and one that would be be for the campesinos, the work, workers in the countryside, um, and he developed teams who would go in and work with them and prepare materials that would be relevant to their lives and that would help them learn not only to read letters on a page, but also to read their world. It was part of a central idea for him. And to do it in a kind of participatory way, a collaborative way that with a kind of action research where people would be taking on projects like the one I mentioned earlier, trying to get a better road or get better access to a clinic. So what I'm gonna give you now is an example of some pages from a literacy campaign um, that was used in Nicaragua after the overthrow of the dictatorship of the Somosas in 1979. And in the early 80s, uh, people, people developed these materials and, and used them. I, I got to pick up a copy of this when I was in Nicaragua in, in 1984. Uh, it's called the, uh, the sort of the, the dawning of the, the people. Um, and the first page of this reader book, right, is really interesting. If you uh, look at it, you know, you can sort of ask, well, what do you see? Um, and if we were all in class right now, it would be interesting to have a conversation about that. But I, I'll just note, as, you know, as in my experience generally, when people look at it, first they see, you know, they tend to see a lot of people. A uh, number of them are smiling. It looks like they're sort of excited, right? Um, they're, they're waving some different stuff. Some of them are like sticks or like actually a rifle. So they got some guns, right? Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a poster being held up, you know, with somebody's face on it, right? And if you were a Nicaraguan in 1981, 82, right? And you saw that poster, you would know it immediately who it was, right? In fact, just the shape of the hat, the, the way the hat curves, right? It's sort of like the Nike swoosh for Nicaraguans then. That was the hat of Augusto Cesar Sandino, who was a revolutionary back in the 20s and 30s in Nicaragua. He was the hero of the revolution that they had, right? And um, what you would, if you were asked sort of what do you see and you were a Nicaraguan back in 1981, the kind of response would be something like, well, es la revolución, I, I, I see the revolution. That's the revolution we've just had, right? People in the streets and stuff. Okay, well, so um, that's the word for this picture, right? That was taken from the community describing a reality that people in your learning group would be familiar with. 
Okay, that's the word, first word for the first lesson, la revolucion, very revolutionary word to start with, especially because um, uh, you notice as you learn to spell la revolucion, it's got vowels in it. In fact, it's got basically all the vowels except Y, A E O U I, right? And so with this one word, you've learned all the vowels which in Spanish, which is what the language this text was produced in, uh, and which is very similar to the Portuguese in this respect, um, is uh, that's, that's sort of a pivotal key to the language, right? Um, unlike English, which has all sorts of weird vowel structures and uh, diphthongs and stuff, it's pretty standard in Spanish. And so you learn these vowels and you got some key building blocks. And then, um, you know, the next lesson, uh, people would look at this and they would say, well, this is, you know, this is, these people are, they're, these people are, they're involved in the struggle, the la lucha, right? La lucha. So, now that, you know, it's not see spot run, run spot run. It's sort of, yeah, this is stuff that matters to us. We've been living through and it's, it's part of our world. And um, the sentence they use for lucha to introduce it is L F S L A N Lucha, the F S L N, which is the the Sandinista Liberation Group um, that liberated the country from Samosa. They they struggle. Okay, so now a next step happens with Freire's technique here, where they've got uh, uh, an opportunity to break down this word into two syllables. So you're not just learning vowels now; you're learning syllables, right? Lu and cha. But because you already know the, the, the vowels, you can learn very quickly uh, all these other syllables. Lu, la, li, lo, le. Right? So you suddenly got five syllables out of one. Right? And you can start to read various stuff, like about leo and el. And then you can even read a sentence on the next page. You can see the picture of Lola, who's the woman sitting down reading, and the sentence says, la lola lay. Um, the, our lola is reading, right? Listen to her, oila, okay? Uh, so, just a few more samples from the book. This is one from later about mujeres and talks about how women were uh, struggling with, with guns. So, Really, the revolution involved a kind of a change in the role of women, much less passive than traditional. Uh, and in the way in which the Catholic Church had been teaching passages from Paul, in which in the, in the New Testament, Paul says, uh, wives submit to your husbands. Uh, it's no longer the conception of women that's being promoted here. But then, and, and also the, uh, the ideas that uh, even that the Christian church was involved in integrating itself with this, uh, this revolution. So the, the sentence for this page is, um, the Christian people uh, are integrate themselves in the struggle and continue defending the advance of the revolution. Okay. This is later, obviously, in the book, but it's not that long a book and people are learning to read this pretty quickly. Okay. Okay, so now, that sort of gives you a sense of, of some of the techniques that Prairie was using. And, I, and then just to understand a little bit more the dynamic of these seminar kinds of processes that people would be involved in, in the theology of liberation groups, and also in the, in the discussion groups that Prairie's educators were leading for literacy. I've got a, uh, uh, some passages from uh, a book that, has transcripts from one of these kind of base, Christian based community discussions back in the, the 70s in Nicaragua. And uh, to appreciate it, it's important maybe to, to, to look at um, the ways in which the Bible is translated because there were the traditional ones where the priests would preach in a kind of monological way and sort of tell poor people what to think. And then there were the new readings or interpretations of the Bible that in new translations 
that we're actually being used soon to uh, to invite them to engage in more dialogical ways of thinking, right? And you can uh, get an idea of this by comparing two translations in English that have that are similarly different. There's the King James version, which King James in the early 1600s commissioned to have done, partly to help reinforce the power of the royalty in Britain and uh, the role of the church as playing out in a kind of preached way, monological way, one point of view way, uh, a vision of what it is to be live the Christian life. And in it, there's a passage where Jesus um, is, um, who's a central figure, obviously, in all in Christianity. Uh, Jesus is, is uh, just beginning his, his mission in life, right, a in Luke. And um, he goes back to his hometown. This is the first time he sort of publicly speaks or preaches, right? And uh, to talk, he pulls uh, a copy of Isaiah off the scroll shelf and reads it to everybody else in the, in the synagogue, right? And from it, he reads the following. And this is the King James Version. So this is the, these are the first words of Jesus that are recorded as public testimony. Um, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Right. Okay, now you can imagine reading that um, as an English peasant in the 1600s or even today and sort of have this kind of a, it's almost like cotton in your mouth, kind of feel like, I wonder if anointed to preach the gospel, heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance, uh, set at liberty the bruised. Except that we are, you know, what, what, it's a little bit hard to figure out what it's all about, right? So there's a, a new international version uh, translated that gives a little bit sharper sense of what way it might have been translated as the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Okay. So here you've got a Jesus who's, what kind of good news, what would be good news for the poor? Oh, not being poor anymore. Right? <laughs> okay. um, and the good news for the prisoners would be, the, you know, like political prisoners getting out of jail, right? And healthcare for people, recovery of sight, and the oppressed, the enslaved, to be freed, right? And the, the, the year of the Lord's favor is, was a technical term. This would be pointed out, these conversations, for uh, the year of Jubilee, which was um, uh, the year in which, a, in Jewish tradition, all debts were forgiven, at least land-related debts, so that people could have their land come back to them when they borrowed on it and lost it, okay? Well, so the, the, this is sort of an example of the way translation can make a difference and sort of sets a frame for thinking about Jesus as somebody who might be envisioned as someone who's bringing good news and liberation, right? Very different conception of the church than the one that the conquistadores arrived with when they conquered Latin America shortly after 1492. So, I appreciate you all bearing with me here. I've just got a little bit more to share. I want to share a dialogue from uh, a, a book by uh, a Nicaraguan priest who recorded uh, conversations he had with peasants who had gone through the literacy process of Freire and this theology of liberation process as well, right? So let me take a go at it here. This commentary was made in the meeting hut this is in, in, in an archipelago in, in Lake Nicaragua. First, we had a lunch of rice and beans and turtle cooked by an Italian, the mother of Elvis and Milagros. The gospel was read by Gloria, one of the youngest girls. 
And afterwards, we commented on the verses that say, the angel came into the place where she was and said to her, I congratulate you, God-favored one. The Lord is with you. God has blessed you more than all other women. I told them that that was the beginning of the Hail Mary and that the angel's first words used to be translated as a greeting. That's what Hail Mary means. But now it's been discovered that the true translation is, I congratulate you. And the prophets often congratulated the, the daughter of Zion, the people of Israel, in this way, because she was going to give birth to a Messiah. Well, Thomas Pena says, said, the angel congratulates her because she's going to be the mother of the Messiah, of, of Jesus. And he congratulates all of us because he means that the Savior is not going to be born among the rich, but right among us, the poor people. And then Felix says, the thing is that the liberator had to be born among the oppressed. And Julio says, it's because he came to liberate the oppressed. That's why he had to be one of them. If he'd come to liberate the rich, he would have been born among the rich. And Pablo says, it's not the rich, but the poor who need liberation. The exploiters aren't the ones who are going to be liberated. Oscar says, <laughs> they'll be liberated from their exploitation. And Olivia says, the rich and the poor will be liberated. Us poor people are going to be liberated from the rich, and the rich are going to be liberated from themselves, that is, from their wealth, because they're more slaves than we are. But when she saw the angel, she was surprised, excuse me, by the at his words and wondered why he greeted her that way. This is continuing the Bible passage. And then the angel said to her, Mary, do not fear, for you have found favor with God. And Thomas Pena said, she must have been very scared. She was very humble, poor little girl. And she's frightened when they tell her she's going to be so important. And young Alejandro says, but there's no reason to be afraid of that. We also could be afraid of being important because we have to do an important mission too. Perhaps being leaders, some of us, to liberate others, to carry out a mission in the community and, and even outside of Solentiname, which is where all this took place, these dialogues, in San Miguelito or San Carlos, we, we, we don't know. So the Bible passage goes on. Now you're going to be pregnant and you will bear a son and you will name him Jesus. I told them that Jesus was a name that was usually translated as savior or salvation, but that now it was better translated as liberator or liberation. The Hebrew name is Jeshua, which means Yahweh liberates or Yahweh is liberation. And someone said, that angel was being subversive just by announcing that. It's as though someone here in Samosa's Nicaragua, Nicaragua was, was announcing a liberator. And another added, and Mary joins the ranks of the subversives too, just by receiving that message. I suppose that by doing that, she probably felt herself entering into a kind of underground the birth of the liberator had to be kept secret. It would be known only by the most trusted friends and a few of the poor people around there, the, the villagers. We have to keep in mind that they were under an oppression. And even the name Jesus was a dangerous name. And then another said, and it's still a dangerous name. And we were saying the name liberation or liberator. We're being subversive too. Okay. So I, I might just by way of context note that um, in the 1960s, when this was recorded in the 70s, um, in Nicaragua and also in other areas of Latin America, 
uh, people who were members of these Christian-based communities, uh, and also people who were involved in Freire-style uh, pedagogy of the oppressed projects, they they uh, you know they were getting people organized, and the governments, the dictators, did not like this. They viewed them as subversives. They viewed them as threats to their government, and uh, they persecuted them. They would arrest them. They would throw them in jail. Um, they would call them communists. You know, which was sort of the ultimate curse word back during the Cold War in those days, especially for dictators that were getting money from the United States government to buy arms and so on. Uh, so people really were, you know, <laughs> in danger in serious ways. And also their analogy to, to the situation of Jesus under the Roman Empire, uh, where Israel had been conquered and was being ruled by uh, at the time of, of Jesus' birth, the story in the Bible is that uh, Herod heard that, that there was going to be a liberator or going to be the, the, this, this Messiah, at any rate, born. And when he heard that, he decided to go into the area where he was supposed to be born. And um, the story is that he had all the, the boys under two years of age killed. And uh, the this, this story is that Jesus' mother and father you know, fled to Egypt in order to be safe. Um, so when you see this story through the eyes of these peasants, you, you read it very differently. Um, but in, in, in any case, it's what's the key thing here to note is that these peasants are starting to see it through their own eyes, through this kind of process of dialogue that exemplifies the kind of dialogical education um, that Prairie is gonna be talking about in chapter two of Pedagogy of Press that I'm asking you guys to read for Monday. And uh, just a, a couple last slides here. This one is of uh, a hut in uh, Nicaragua in the 1970s. And um, it, it's interesting because on the wall, you can see Che Guevara on the left and Jesus on the right. Uh, and this sort of exemplifies the ways in which uh, socialists, communists, folks who were following the Cuban sort of approach to revolution were joining with uh, Christians uh, to try and transform people's lives um, through a revolution in, not just in, in political power, but in culture. The name of this book actually is Faith in the Revolution and Revolution in the Culture. Well, the idea was to have a transformation, not just of who held the guns and controlled the world, but who taught people to read and write and how they did and how they learned to reason and collaborate together. Uh, oops, and uh, so out of this kind of collaboration of the theology of liberation and, and Paulo Freire, a kind of basic practice emerged where people would talk about it sort of in three and a half steps. The first step being you have to see the world, you look at the pictures, you look at your own life situation. And then secondly, you, you judge it or interpret it. You know? And then third, you act, you do something about it. You know? And there's a, a fourth, Kind of stage that especially in the in the uh, theology of liberation tradition they emphasize which is and then after you act you know you celebrate <laughs> if you've accomplished something let's have a party right um that is sort of a very basic simple way of understanding a kind of di co collaborative dialogue process um for people and how these childlike peasants could become mature subjects and agents of history. Sort of be one way to, uh, I don't wanna insult them because by calling them childlike, but just reference the way in which from the point of view of mainstream education, uh, the people Frary was working with were viewed as at the level of intelligence and competence of a child. Um, but they, they were sort of learning to acquire all these other more, uh, more sophisticated forms of uh, reading, writing and talking. Um, through a, a process that, you know, in its very essence could be described relatively simply in terms of these four steps. But it actually involved a lots of significant, sophisticated, implicit assumptions 
about what it is to be a human, what it is to be in relation with others, what it is to change the world, what it is to be in community. And um, so I just would close with a uh, kind of a, a little passage here that illustrates the way in which sort of Hegelian, Marxist, existentialist, and other ideas sort of enter in to that thinking and that tradition. Um, one way to sort of describe the process, it's more complicated than that just sort of, you know, see, judge, act, celebrate, would be to say that the pedagogy of the oppressed involves a practice of cultural action that uh, leading to cultural revolution in a dialectical process in which teacher students and student teachers engage in authentic dialogue in which the students learn to name the world and become subjects instead of mere objects through a, pra a praxis of conscientization or conscientization by which they liberate themselves from alienating social conditions and false consciousness and achieve progressive humanization. So the reading from Prairie will give you some ideas about what to make of that kind of gobbledygooky sentence and how we might have more dialogue about it and thinking about how not only to educate ourselves and live our lives, but how to uh, engage with AI that's increasingly structuring our world and becoming a part of our lives. I look forward to talking with you all about all this stuff and the questions that you should bring to class on Monday, uh, the four, and talking not only about this, but the social dilemma video that I'm also asking you to watch, which lays out really other interesting ways of understanding how oppression may be occurring in our current um, developed world or high tech world where social media provide a new form of alienation and false consciousness. See y'all then. <laughs>